I guess I need to cue this. Welcome back, everybody. I think most of you are here for the uh, workshop we just finished. Uh, if you do not have a handout for this second workshop, uh, please raise your hand. We'll make sure you get one. Okay, right there. There's one here. Thank you. Um, the the previous workshop we just got finished up with is was uh, installing Swift, the the pure open source. Uh, uh, OpenStack, I mean, uh, implementation of Swift, I mean, actually, very, very recent code, uh, something you can all do right now. But you may have noticed it was a little tricky, and so we are going to have a second workshop right now following on to that, installing Swift and looking at some of the management functionality that SwiftStack uh, and the SwiftStack controller brings you. Uh, as a way of introduction, my name is John Dickinson, uh, this is Joe Arnold, and uh, Hugo here will be driving on the, yep. uh, on the laptop. And uh, we, do, we do have uh, books, and that it even covers what we talked about in the past workshop in more detail about all of the steps to configure and set up and run Swift. So if we, didn't, if we did go through blow through things pretty quickly in the workshop, um, but this covers it uh, a bit more uh, step by step and in more depth. We have 10 books left. Okay, so, so in this workshop, we're going we're gonna to walk through the process of setting up Swift uh, using the, uh, some deployment automation uh, with Swift Stack. So there's a couple of things on the handout. First is a, a new Rackspace instance. Again, they didn't like us creating a lot of EBS or uh, block volumes uh, on their environment. Uh, but there's a unique one on every single handout with a, with a sticker there. There's also a login for, and Hugo will show it, for the uh, platform.swiftstack.com. So we've created temporary accounts right now for, uh, that you can use to log into the, the platform. So both of these things are running in the cloud right now, um, which is for demonstration purposes. And when you do your own deployment, of course, all this stuff exists in your own infrastructure. But. Sure. Question? No, so here's, here's the... Uh, so there's two, so demo... Access password moderator? Your username and, and password for... So that VMs. is for the SSH. Uh -huh. So yeah, that's a good question. So on here, there's a, a VM credentials. So that's the, the, the virtual machine instance that we have running um, on in the cloud. And so you'd log, you'd SSH into the IP address and use the, uh, the username and password for that SSH instance. And then the platform credentials would be the, the, the website uh, uh, on the top there. And what about the UPS this demo? So you need a SSH, so you need to open up an SSH terminal to log into your instance. Yeah, you need to get SSH to, to log into the, to that IP address. And Clay can probably help with that. If there are any questions during the whole thing, uh, just feel free to raise your hand, and uh, one of us will come by and uh, help you out. So the first, so we'll, we'll be operating in two windows while we do this. One is the web browser um, with, the, the, with, with the, uh, the controller, which is what Hugo has here. And the other window will be an SSH terminal on the node itself, so we can walk through the commands there. So the first thing uh, we, we do is we need to name the cluster. And this is just a canonical, just a name that you give uh, that you're going to address the cluster as, just for labeling purposes. And then there's an option for a load balancer. Well, we're only going to be using one instance here, so leave it unchecked. Um, and if you check this, if you check this box, what happens is you would put in a virtual IP that you have that can can be used by, that, that is on the same subnet as all of the, the nodes in the, in the cluster. In this example, what we're going to do is we're going to put the IP address of the virtual machine instance that we have. It's on the front sticker on the, on the bottom, and that's the IP address that you'll want to put in there. And what this is going to be used for is it's going to be included in the authentication. So when re an authentication response gets handed back, 
that it knows what IP should be used in there. Yeah, so do not check the, 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 the load balancer here. So then the next one, it would be an, uh, a host name and an environment where you would have DNS configured to map to a virtual IP. That's the host name that you'd put, put in here. And those are the cluster configuration settings. Yeah, you can put any name you want. No, yeah, just call it whatever you want. Yep. In the name at the top, yeah. Not in the host name, not in the host name. Yeah, don't. Leave the uh, host name blank. Yeah, leave the host name blank in this example because we haven't set up DNS for any of these uh, environments. And then click create. Yeah, uncheck, uncheck the load balancer and then hit save. Yeah. So the next thing is let's log into the, the instance and we're going to do, do the Swift install. So there's a command to run and uh, Hugo will be running, uh, running this command. So it's just, we're gonna curl um, a we're gonna grab a bunch of commands, to, a wad of commands to run uh, from this URL. So it's gonna be platform, HTTPS, platform.swiftstack.com slash install underscore Ubuntu. And that's just gonna spit out a bunch of commands. And we're just gonna do this so we can see what's happening. You can pipe this into bash if you really trust us. But as administrators, I wouldn't recommend trusting anyone all that, all that much. So spit them out and you can see what we're actually gonna run and then we can pipe it to bash and, and execute them all. Now if, if you're running uh, CentOS or Red Hat, then this Ubuntu gets replaced with that operating system. We don't support SUSE, no. So Red Hat, CentOS, and Ubuntu are the three that are supported. And so if you trust it, don't forget the sudo, uh, pipe that whole thing to bash. And the steps that we're doing here, the, most, of the, most of this uh, here is about uh, adding, adding a trust, adding a key to, the, uh, to the, the package archive, to the PPA. So that's mostly what the first few commands are doing. And then the next, we are doing an app get install. And after that app get install it happens, we're, we're registering this node or this, this environment with the platform, with, with into the controller. And the controller is gonna phone home and give us back a, a URL of a unique identifier for that, for that node. And so that's the steps that's happening here. I'll illustrate it a little bit better here. So the node, what it's, what, it's do, what it's gonna be doing, and what we're gonna walk through next here, as this is installing, is that the, the node registers itself with the controller, it will set up a VPN session, and then what the controller can do is it can do the ring building, like we did in the last workshop, and push that configuration out to the node. So that's what's happening here. And if you see what Hugo did, there's the that URL, and that's the URL you wanna follow to do the next step. Tell me. What's up? The SS claim oh, URL? Oh, it's, not, it's saying it's not found? So then that, so this didn't happen for some reason. We can get some help for him. So what happened is 
it tried to run that command, and then the, maybe the rest of the, the installation didn't happen. So maybe we had a, a, a glitch in the, in the install process. Does it work? Okay, cool. Yeah, so you, pop, you follow that. And this is what you'll see. And eventually it'll turn, it should turn green. Yep, and so it's going, yep, it's sitting there. It's timed out, timed out. It's gonna, it takes a while to establish a VPN session uh, between uh, two points. So that's what it's doing, and eventually you should see something green happen. Oh, yeah, yeah, so log in, log in, log in right here. Yeah. So log into that, on the, there's a sticker on the, back, on the front page. So from SSH? Yeah, SSH into uh, that IP address. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now when you go to your SSH session, yep, follow that URL right there. So yeah, you'll see at the very bottom of the output after the package install, you'll see that, that claim URL. Do we, how, how many people have gotten to this step? Awesome, great. So the next thing, and you'll see Hugo do this live, is you'll say add this node to the cluster. And there's a few drop downs here It'll say which cluster do you want. There's only one. It'll be the cluster that you just created. Zone, new zone, since there's no devices yet. But if you're, when you're adding new devices, you'll be able to say, this device lives in this zone. And shortly we'll have region. That just got added for Grizzly, so that's coming up soon. And then there's two interfaces. In Swift, we, we, we didn't talk about this in the, in the previous one, but it, it's worth it's worth, worth talking about here. There's a, there's a, f a front-facing network which the clients interact with the proxy servers. And that's, a, that's what we call the front-facing network. Then there's a internal storage network, which is, which is a private network to that cluster. And so this is where you set each one of those. And in this example, uh, Hugo, do, where do we set these to? And do they both get set to the same thing, or do we set? I picked it up on, on its own? Okay, okay, good. That's good? That's right? Okay. So ETH0 is your outward facing, ETH1 is the cluster facing, or the private IP, IP space. Correct, correct. Yeah, sorry, I didn't catch that up. Yeah, so it'd be a 10 dot or 192, one, one, you know, 168 or. Well, if it, if your, if your configuration, this is a pretty default way to set things up, and so that's our default. But if you have something different, yeah, you might have different interfaces on there. Um, it's not, it's not uncommon to have a management interface, a, um, you know, one for different networks that are on the system. So those will all get picked up, and then it, those are available as a drop down. To be selected. Yeah. For default, we assume. Yeah, correct. ETH one is the is the is the public facing one. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Well, this, well, this is running. We just we could have spun up environments anywhere. We just happened to do it at Rackspace. We could have done this at on EC two. You know, HP Cloud. Yeah, it didn't really. It was arbitrary where we set, we spun it up. Yeah, here you go. Do you want to scroll down a little bit? So this, this, this is what if you wanted, to, if you were creating a for convenience, if you wanted to add this node to a new cluster, then you would put in the new cluster there and, and create the cluster. That's all. Yeah, leave the blank, leave that below, blank below, and click add node to cluster. So that's the next thing you want to do, Hugo. Yeah, so yeah. 
No, yeah, that's, a, that's another good question. So it, it goes down to how the data placement happens in Swift. Repeat the question. We're just going to uniquely place data across the three drives we have, and there's no minimum requirement in Swift. Repeat the question. Oh, yeah. The question was, hey, we're just installing on one node. Don't you require three nodes? And you know, the answer is, well, to have durability, the minimum re requirement is to have at least three drives. It's very nice to have more durability by having more nodes, um, but it's not necessarily a requirement. And that's what we're doing here just because we're not wanting to spin up a bunch of instances for, for all, all the workshop here. Yeah. Yeah, so this, this can be, so, for, so the, the question was, can this be done in a private environment? And the answer is yes. So we just are doing this on public cloud instances for the purposes of the workshop. And all of the people who are running this, this is a private environment with, on physical hardware with their, with their own systems that they're managing. And what we're using right now is a controller that is hosted as a service, and we have we, we have people who are running this as a service, but that environment can also be picked up and brought in an in-house uh, environment as well. So this is a really good way to run a workshop, but it's not necessarily exactly how uh, environments are set up. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to do is we'll have that node will appear in yellow and we're going to click on that provision node. The yellow means that it's not ready to go. We haven't told, we haven't told the cluster, hey, here's what I want to do with each device. Do I do this one? Yep. In this case, uh, now that you need, now you need to tell the controller, here's what we need to do with this server. So when you click on the provision, you're going to come up with uh, the node management, node configuration page. And you need to assign this into a, a zone. You see Hugo just set this as zone one, which since we're dealing with this in the workshop situation, this node is in its own unique failure domain. And there is no other one. So we're just going to do node one. And then we need to start looking at the drives. And so you'll see that the uh, controller has automatically detected all of the drives that are on that system. And so we need to now tell uh, it which ones are going to be used for uh, account and container data and which ones are going to be used for object data. And first, we're going to format. So what Hugo did was he set the, can you scroll down just a little bit more, Hugo? There is uh, XVSDC, um, which I, uh, is the boot partition. Yep. Swap. We don't want to add the swap into our cluster as data. So don't do that. So there's a checkbox here that says ignore and check that. And then the next step would be to format the drives. And you can click either one of these format, and that will go through the process of formatting it. So that's the first step, is to format the drives. Just like in the workshop, we did an XFS format. That's the activity that we do here. Yeah, so now we're, yeah, go for it. Okay, yeah. so notice that there are two options here. You can, add your you can add these drives as new drives either immediately, right now, or over time in a, in a gradual sense. And the difference here, if you remember back from the first workshop, if you were here, um, it, it is how we uh, add in the nodes into the cluster. So if we add them, if we add them all at once, what this means is this, this data is immediately available to the cluster, but you're going to have potentially uh, a, a essentially a replication storm uh, as all of the data is rebalanced out to, to immediately try to fill up this new thing. Um, most of the time, especially in, in production clusters that are, have customers interacting with them right now, you don't want to do that because that's going to potentially adversely impact your actual customer traffic. And you don't want simply a, a standard operational procedure to uh, negatively impact your uptime or your SLAs or things like that that you have with your customers. So in that case, uh, what we have here is the option to automatically add it gradually. And if you remember from the first workshop, each node within Swift has the concept of a weight. 
And this weight is basically how, how much data relative to the other drives it's going to be getting uh, of, the, of the overall um, uh, data capacity. And so and behind the scenes, the ad gradually will be used for uh, setting it to a small weight and making sure things are, are rebalanced and, and migrated appropriately. Then it uh, increments it by a small amount and continues to do so, um, uh, allowing you to uh, smooth out that, uh, that data migration within your cluster uh, over a period of time so that you don't have to worry about saturating your network, you don't have to worry about adversely impacting your clients or anything like that. So that also, the other thing you can do is if, if uh, you notice a drive or a node wigging out, and throwing out some errors, and you want to decom it, what you can do is you can click remove gradually. And yeah, it may be limping along, but you can just seep that data out over the course of a few days uh, and, and then swap it out. So that's the other thing that's pretty useful here. And this becomes exceptionally useful when you start dealing with uh, larger nodes which have uh, 24, 36, 48, 3T drives behind them. You need to drain those things gradually so you can uh, decommission hardware as you need to gradually. Gradually, uh, over in our in our case is we do two terabytes an hour by default. Okay. Okay. So there's a fixed rate. We do a fixed rate right now. So, we're, we're, you know, there's there's enhancements there that we can make it more more dynamic, like more aggressive at night, for example. Yeah, based on utilization. Yeah, correct. So where's the proxy? Where is the proxy server running? In this case, the proxy server is running on all of these uh, nodes as well. So you've got the storage uh, servers and you've got the proxy servers all running at the same point. And in this particular case for this workshop, it's one node. Everything's running everywhere. And we, go ahead. So if you wanted to have a node be a proxy, essentially what that means is you have a node without any data drives on it. So it's just nothing is allocated for it. Yep. And then, and then there's a way to say, don't add the load don't add storage nodes into the load balancing group now in this case um, we've got some brand new drives with a brand new cluster so essentially all you need to do is click the add now uh, for your drives and this will immediately add all of them so they're all uh, all immediately available and your data migration of zero bytes will happen instantaneously And now we're good to go. So you'll see that uh, once you do that, the, uh, the uh, status changes to in use on, uh, you see it's in the orange box here on the screen. Uh, and so these drives are ready to be used. Oh, uh, here you go. So now we need to enable the node. So if you scroll down at the bottom there, you can see that uh, you've got uh, the option to uh, configure your networks appropriately, if, but it should be set uh, correctly from our previous step when you added it into the cluster. Uh, and we're going to uh, click on Enable Node. So now if you can, hang on just a second, Hugo. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, once you do that, you're gonna come back and you're going to see that the, uh, uh, the, the node has been enabled instead of being yellow. It is now green, and so you can see that this node is ready to be used. But we're not quite ready yet because we've got some other interesting things we're gonna enable uh, for the, the entire cluster. So to start with, we're first going to enable uh, some different middleware. So we'll give you just a nice easy point and click interface to uh, uh, enable or disable middleware. Yep. So at, at the bottom there, you can uh, click on the enable middleware button. And that'll get you to this screen here. So in this case, uh, for the purposes of this uh, workshop today, I want you to click on uh, three of them. You want to enable uh, the Swift Web Console, Temp URL, and Form Post. And what this is going to let, uh, allow us to do a little bit later is actually browse the contents of the Swift cluster from the Swift cluster itself with the Web Console, um, and also uh, upload and uh, download data uh, through that Web Console. So once those are done, well, let's make sure. Is everybody done? Yeah, so there's just a walk through really quickly here. There's a few things that you can enable. Um, we, there's actually, th there's a bunch of different authentication uh, set up on here. So we have Keystone Auth. So that is used for if you have a, a, a Keystone uh, system already set up, what you can do, and click on that to go really quick. Yeah, with, on Keystone, you can enter in information about your Keystone setup. 
And in that way, you can use that Keystone system to authenticate and then carry that token that it's going to give you and hand it to the Swift cluster, and then the authorization will happen if, when this is enabled. So in, yeah, there are, two, there are two complementary pieces. You need to do both of them, actually. Uh, it, it happens to be they're implemented on the back end, and so that's, a, that's exposed there right now. Yeah. But it, it's, they're part of the same, they're two halves of the same coin. Correct. So tempoth, tempoth is a, it's a, we, it ships with Swift. It's, it's temporary. It's, it's useful for purposes of doing development work. However, there's a few downsides that it's worth pointing out. One is that the passwords, the keys are stored in plain text. Um, and then it, because where it's configured is in the swift.comp file, that means you need to issue a, a proxy restart to, to have new accounts take hold. So those are, the, those are the two caveats of using, using Tefoth. The pros are if you don't have a lot of dynamism in, in, in how many accounts you have on the system, it's really fast. So how do you decide which agents are managed through available strict middleware certification? How did we decide? Uh, we, we picked a set of, of defaults that we knew our customers were going to be successful at. And even here, we only recent, even recently added Keystone, you know, because the Grizzly support for it uh, is good, um, and it's ready, it's ready for, for production now. So Swift, yeah, I, I, we probably should have baselined. And the question is, can, is this block storage too? And I guess I should have baselined this whole, both this session and this, the, the, this session on Swift is an object storage system. And that's what, all it does. And it does it exceptionally well. And that's what it's focused on. Uh, and, and so we're trying to represent and store objects really, really well. And do so in a way that is highly available, very durable, and has, uh, can support many, many transactions happening all, all on the same system. Right, so uh, the, the comment is that there's, uh, within OpenStack, there's, uh, there's a lot of documentation that has to do with this kind of storage and other things. And generally my answer is that, yes, we've got, we've got a broad uh, suite of products and projects within the open, OpenStack ecosystem all of which are solving particular use cases. Swift is solving the object storage use case and is different from, say, Cinder, which is uh, focused on so, block storage and compute for, uh, storage for compute. So the next thing is what we're going to do is we're going to, so kind of tying into the account creation, we're going, there's a, we put a web UI uh, for account creation here. And so when you go back to the cluster manage page, you can click on, go ahead, Hugo, click on the manage storage accounts. And so that's what we'll be doing next. And here, create a username, create a password, and that will be that will get put when we click the next step. That'll get pushed out to the to the cluster. So we'll add an account here, and then when we add an account, we'll need to do a push. We need to push a new configuration out to the cluster. Um, if you're only changing accounts, it'll just do a lightweight push out. If there are pending changes to be made um, with the ring, we're going to do a ring rebuild. And so push the button, and we're going to build a ring, or the platform's going to build a ring and push that configuration out to that node. And this takes a few minutes, because we're, not do we're doing a much bigger ring than we did in the, la in the previous uh, in, in the previous workshop, we actually sized that down so it would go fast. Uh, the part power that we set by default is 18, and it's a configurable setting on a cluster. So if we're doing if we're doing installs, then uh, we can tune that. Two to the eighteenth is the number of partitions that will be that will be created um, in this in this example. So are people waiting now? They've clicked uh, push configs, and you've got the blue box on your screen. You're waiting for that to be 
wait for that to be pushed. If there's okay, uh, so it's, all right. It, so we got some people already. Awesome. Already finished so if the anybody play. has any problems at this point, okay, just go ahead and raise your hand, please. Martin's got you. Yeah, you can log into the node, and you can tail. So there's going to be a few logs that you can look at. you can look at. There's going to be the um, the Swift log. So where's Daryl? Daryl Varlog Swift. All, all log, right? Varlog Swift all log, which will which will show what's happening on Swift. And then for because you haven't done anything yet, and if you want to see what's happening, the communication that's going to be opt ss log. Uh, the SS, uh, SS node var var log SS node D dot log, and there you'll see the interactions happening between the controller uh, and the and the cluster. Uh, when you're uh, if you're wanting to log in directly to your machine, you can use the credentials on your on your workshop. But uh, the uh, yes, the credentials that you created in the controller are what you use for uh, communicating with your Swift cluster, which is soon as we're going to do that as soon as we've got uh, people with the uh, configuration push. Yes. So, How long is it supposed to take? Well, we're all so, doing it all at once. <laughs> so what's happening? What's happening on on this particular this controller happening. is we have set up um, a, a thread pool, and each one has a core, and is taking each one in turn. So we have some lucky uh, people up in the front. And as the pool uh, gets worked through, and I think we're running uh, 16, how many are running, Daryl? Um, eight. eight. So be patient. So we'll, it'll, get, it'll get through. Daryl's watching him, watching him go through right now. But what's, what's, what's happening is in, in queue, a new ring is getting built based on the information that uh, you told it to do, plus what we read, read in about, uh, about the node. We've formatted the devices. We've given each device a, a unique label um, using a, a UUID. And now a ring's being built, and we're pushing the configuration out. Uh, and, and so if you, if you put add gradually, we got another winner over here. Um, it, if you put at gradually, it would have built a partially weighted ring for those devices, and then on schedule every hour, a new ring would be built where the weight on each device increases a little bit more, and then that ring got, will get pushed out. We are almost done. Correct, correct, correct. So each node establishes its own VPN credentials. So uh, you know, back to this this picture over here. The node the node doesn't need to open up any ports to talk to the controller. It is it is initiating the session from the node out to the controller that it's supposed that's supposed to manage it, and then. A, we actually we use zero MQ to establish a message bus between the node and the controller, and then that's where what commands are sent over. So when a new uh, a, a new ring is available, it'll say, "Go fetch a new ring." Here's its location. It will pull down the ring, and and then that uh, ring will be checksum to ensure it's consistent across all of the nodes, and then we'll stage it and then flop over flop over to that new ring. And so I, I, the, way, the way that Swift, what it looks like to me, um, it, if I'm going to create a, I don't, how, I, how I think about it is Swift has, has the, a few services. You have the routing and access and authentication layers to it, and that's represented by the proxy server started by the authentication services, and it's routing the requests to where the data is located. Um, and then below that, we have uh, st storage intelligence, I don't know what to call it, but 
something that is each node has certain behaviors, and the ring provides the roadmap of how to behave and how to replicate data around and how consistency checking is happening, how replication works. And then there's the physical hardware itself that is actually storing the data. And then the controller, because each node in the system really isn't aware of the other nodes, it's just, you're just telling it to behave in a particular way. It doesn't, each node doesn't have global knowledge about every node in the cluster. I mean, that's how a distributed system has to work um, in order to scale. And so what the controller does is it has that, it's taking in the data about the health of each node. So if a drive is failing, it can pull in, say, there's an error in a log file. We have smart data that gets picked up. Uh, uh, if, if the disk becomes unmounted, all of those are signals that something's up with the drive, and then that will get picked up and, conver say, converted into an alert. Um, if, uh, if you're adding capacity or decommissioning equipment, then that, that, that's world view of a distributed system that, that blo that's in a controller so that uh, configs can be pushed out to the, to the nodes. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the only thing that the control, the controller is all out of band, right? So it's only getting, it's only getting a tiny trickle, like you don't even need a, you can have an acoustic coupler, you know, and send the amount of data that's going back and forth between the controller and the, and the node. Because, I mean, if you, look, if you think about it, the ring is a relatively small file. The data points for monitoring are relatively low amounts of, of data. Um, it's, I mean, it's small kilobits per second uh, amount of monitoring data. So what's the bottleneck going on? What's so what's, what we're waiting for is the gener that builder file, because we're using production size builder files, to distill down into, uh, into a ring. And for 100 people. For 100 people. All at once. All at once. So we set up an environment uh, to, we set up, well, we set up an environment where we had, uh, we have a, we have a, a queue of, uh, of, of eight workers that are just queuing them up. So it takes uh, about four minutes per uh, to do. And so we had to kind of do the back of the envelope map on what we wanted to set up for the workshop to, to get through. So that's what's happening, and in every, because uh, we're building that ring, and then when the ring's ready, then it gets pushed out to the to How the many results. people have it finished so far? Have. Have. Good. Yeah, so we have, I, I, yeah, it kind of makes sense. There's about half the room now has it, has it figured out, or has it, has it, it's in queued so and gotten you, to those particular nodes. Uh, once we should have said it was done, a race. Yeah, I think, and um, looking at time, though, just uh, uh, once, if you do have that done already, yeah. Uh, one thing you will be able to do is, oh, look, and Hugo has it done uh, just now. Okay. Uh, so uh, are we going to the, the web console? Yeah. Yeah, we, let's, let's. So we could play with the Swift, uh, Swift uh, overall, but just to quickly give you a, a nice little thing. We, and remember, we enabled the uh, web console middleware. So now if you go to your IP address, the one that's listed on, on the front of your workshop, in a browser on your, on your, um, your host machine, on your laptop, then uh, slash console, then you will be able to uh, see a nice there's a uh, link. white label console. There's oh, a, and there's a link yeah, on, the, a link on the website there. right there. Um, yeah, it is. Ours. It's something yeah. we wrote, yeah. yeah. But it's also fairly white label, label so you can, you can do what you need to with it. Um, and also that is using, taking advantage of some nice uh, JavaScript, HTML5, and stuff like that, so you can drag and drop, upload uh, a new object into your Swift cluster. Yeah, all, so all, all those features, uh, go ahead, sir, with the question. Well, contact support, here he comes. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, so the way the, the way the client is built, it's using the, the, some, the features that are built into Swift. So it's a, it's a, it's a, JavaScript library that speaks the Swift API. And it does using, it uses the features like form posts, like temp URL, uh, so that you can, from the browser, directly post into, uh, uh, into, the, into the Swift cluster. And upload cat pictures, yeah. Can fix this fail? Is it a timeout problem? Could be. 
so we go back and just try to. Yeah, I would try it again. Oh, you need to uh, demo. Yeah, 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 go back. Yeah, that should be good. Yeah, we 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 build by this. Yeah, we'll, let's talk after the workshop on this. So, yeah, the, the drag and drop a file onto there. So it looks like we're we're going to be heading up into the time limits here. And we're about five minutes over already. Oh, into a break. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to thank you and end the workshop here. And then if you have further questions, what we'll be is here as long as we can. But I think there's going to be another workshop coming in, so we'll filter out into the, into the hallway and answer any other questions that you may have. Okay, and one, uh, one last point, last point. We have, uh, I think it looks like five or six ex uh, books up here and we have some t-shirts by the door. Not enough for everybody, but just first come, first serve. So sorry guys sitting over here. Congratulations over here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right.